Good morning, everybody. Namaste. My name is Amanpreet Singh Vaseed, and I'm representing the ACC as a social media ambassador here at the beautiful ESC and World Heart Federation Convention in Madrid, Spain. I'm also serving as on the early work career working group with the American Society of Preventive Cardiology and on the board of directors for the American Association of Cardiologists of Indian Origin. Apart from this, my affiliations include Bharti Vidya Peet University Medical College in Pune, and I also serve as the IMG Research Chair for the RP MSRF and the Founder Managing Director for Hriday Amrit Foundation. So I think uh, when somebody asks me that, what are you doing here? What kind of science and relationships that you are expecting to make at ESC? The only thing that comes to my mind is meaningful relationships, which I've always reiterated before as well. ESC is the largest meeting of cardiologists in the world. And this time even more, because this time we have the World Heart Federation coming together with the ESC, having a beautiful platform for not only early career working professionals like me, but also fellows, professionals, para uh, clinical staff and allied healthcare professionals. I think this meeting is all about understanding what is going on all over the world, but also trying to see where you fit in. Because we have so much to offer here, especially not only from a student level, a resident, a fellow, but also from a proper healthcare cardiologist or a professional level. ESC has some amazing trials which were presented yesterday, the podcast trial, the Amalfi trial, the digit heart failure, you know, and it's also so beautiful to see that the negative trials are also being equally represented here, which is sometimes overlooked in other clinical scientific conventions. And that is where I think all of the matters comes together. ESC as a platform is a wonderful opportunity for early career budding professionals like me to come to meet, to engage and to get inspired by people, their work and the research. We've seen some cutting edge research that has been presented here. State of the art pharmaceutical industrialists showcasing their work, which is just phenomenal. From Mavacampton in Hokum to AFib, there is just so much which is being covered here. This time we even have the hot paths to also focus on different pathways which were overlooked earlier. So I think overall we're looking forward to a really, really robust convention, one of its kind that we are going to do here. So looking forward to it. And I think it's also important to present your own work and share it with your peers, because as we, sh as it's, it's very well known that knowledge shared is knowledge gained. And it's also a beautiful amalgamation of students and early career healthcare professionals who can build meaningful relationships for not just this convention, but for a lifetime. So with this, I really look forward to attending, engaging, and presenting my work at the ESC with the World Heart Federation here in Madrid, Spain. I'm really excited to share my work under my mentors, which was performed at the Mount Sinai Fuster Heart Hospital in New York in the United States of America. Under the mentorship of Dr. Gagan Sani and Dr. Omar al Daibi. we are today presenting a case which is a very rare case of refractory hypertension despite adrenalectomy. I think the, the reason why we wanted to present it at ESC was to also kind of make people interested in the topic of secondary hypertension from the standpoint of adrenal cortical carcinoma, which is sometimes an overlooked entity because most of them are incidentalomas, which are just seen or spotted via normal scans. But in this case, we had a patient, a 55-year-old female, who had refractory hypertension attributed to a long case of adrenal cortical carcinoma. Despite adrenalectomy, 13 years later, she developed metastasis to the, uh, the liver and the lung. And that is where it all started. She was hypertensive with her pressures being in 160s and 170s, despite maximally tolerated antihypertensive regimen dose for secondary hypertension more or less super therapeutic regimens with spironolactone going up to 800 milligrams per day. A multi-tumor uh, interdisciplinary team was convened and it was decided to undergo with a robotic assisted hepatectomy. And that is where we understood that adrenal cortical carcinomas can be notorious. They cannot just be residing in the adrenal cortex, but when it comes to metastasis, we have never heard of such supra therapeutic doses being used. That is where we went and we under, the patient underwent a secondary um, hypertension, uh, 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 hepatectomy for secondary hypertension and boom, the pressures came down. The pressures were normalized, EKG was fine. There were no abnormalities on the echo or any other investigation modalities. 
the patient was gradually brought down to spironolactone on 50 milligrams per day and later on she is being followed up and is perfectly fine the essence and not going into the nitty gritties of the cases that we will be discussing here but i think the essence of presenting this case is to highlight the importance of secondary hypertension because adrenal cortical carcinomas make just 2.5% of the cases of secondary hypertension the only limitation is that there is no universal guideline for secondary hypertension attributed to adrenal cortical carcinomas and that is where it has to be a personalized regimen a personalized and a comprehensive approach using a cardiologist a cardio oncologist a hypertensive specialist and the whole team coming together to see what is best for the patient so in this case we did the hepatic resection robotic assisted and the patient was fine and she is being followed up ever since and she is doing fine but as as i mentioned again that the essence of this is the way we treat secondary hypertension the need for proper personalized guideline based medical therapy for adrenal cortical carcinoma and secondary hypertension because that is something which if it comes more we'll have to treat more and we need to have guidelines for that but that said secondary hypertension is on the rise and according to the esc guidelines last year almost all of the patients who are even suspected to have secondary hypertension despite their medical doses need to be screened for the same so i think this was the main highlight and the key take away from my presentation today i'm looking forward to engaging more with people and what their treatment modalities are for secondary hypertension and even for treating adrenal cortical carcinomas because as i said it can be a notorious malignancy to treat so i thank you all for your patient attention and i look forward to presenting my science here thank you So I'm honored to be presenting a case here under the formal guidance and mentorship of Dr. Eugene Yang from the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle in the United States. We are presenting a case which is a very rare of its own, a third of its kind, arsenic trioxide induced non-sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia independent of QT prolongation in a patient of acute promyelocytic leukemia. I think the reason why the case stands out is stands out is because it is just the third case which has nsvt induced by arsenic trioxide in a case of as i said acute promyelocytic leukemia but here's the caveat it's independent of qt prolongation which is just the third of its kind in the world to be documented we're presenting a case of a 63 year old woman who presented with fatigue rashes and mucosal bleeding on further investigations she was found to have pancytopenia electrocardiogram echocardiography and other modalities were done and it was found after the bone marrow biopsy that she had a rara arrangement and it was confirmed that she was diagnosed with acute promyelocytic leukemia we started in the induction chemotherapy with arsenic trioxide 0.15 mg per kg per the square and then followed up with other dosing about 4 to 5 hours into the chemotherapy she started having palpitations serial monitoring of the ekg showed that she developed multiple episodes of acute um, monomorphic non sustained ventricular tachycardia independent of qt prolongation the largest the longest one going up to about 8 to 10 seconds and that's where it struck us that she was developing this arrhythmia probably attributed to the chemotherapy that she was undergoing she was started on metoprolol amiodrone all of these drugs to help reduce the arrhythmia but in order to maintain a proper decorum of the chemotherapy and not to induce redifferentiation syndrome we had discontinued amiodrone obviously switched it to mexalatine lastly in order for us to make sure that we have not induced any drug induced qt prolongation or any other arrhythmic problem in the patient attributed to electrolyte disturbances or other means after that the arrhythmia did settle and the patient is doing fine regularly followed up but i think the hallmark and the key take away from this case is that when we are inducing a patient of um, acute promyelocytic leukemia with arsenic trioxide atra and other chemotherapy based regimen it's important to monitor the patient for arrhythmias for electrolyte disturbances something which although is done routinely should be done more carefully because this is a case in which we were very surprised that there was no qt prolongation ideally in these cases when we start the drug QT prolongation is the hallmark which leads to uh, monomorphic non sustained ventricular tachycardia but in this case there was no QT prolongation that means it's important to understand the role of other electrolyte imbalances and other molecular mechanisms taking place in order to be inducing the arrhythmia in these patients 
regular management should be done in these patients but i think what is more important is a personalized comprehensive approach a multidisciplinary cardiac team as they call it these days coming together of an electrophysiologist a heart care specialist an oncologist and i think cardio oncology is being beautifully portrayed here at the esc cardio oncology is something which is a bridging gap between two different uh, super specialties cardiology and oncology as simple as that but in these patients it is a hallmark because what we do when we treat a patient it is a very important to overlook different entities while we are giving the therapy so just to sum it all up i think a personalized in, an interventional approach to these patients is crucial electrolyte management proper supplementation trying to avoid any drugs that prolong or potentially prolong qt uh, intervals in these patients and also to have a continuous remote monitoring done whether it's tele monitoring or remote holter monitoring in these patients even after the chemotherapy is settled up might be considerable unfortunately there are no formal guidelines as to how to treat ato induced nsvt in patients without qt prolongation but i'm sure in the time to come there will be some proper guidelines which will be helping us navigate this path but my main essence was here to highlight the importance of arsenic trioxide causing nsvt independent of qt prolongation and we should always bear that in mind that qt prolongation obviously is a notorious marker for proarrhythmic kind of profiles in these patients but even without qt prolongation we can have problems of arrhythmias in these patients so i think with that looking forward to a great convention and also to engaging with other cardio oncologists and young budding cardiologists here at the esc thank you so much